Kabul. A reminder of the difficulties facing those escaping the Taliban regime and the importance of the heroic efforts our armed forces are making in Afghanistan tonight to get as many people out to safety. But tonight, the White House warning another terror attack in Kabul is likely. Afghan military forcing away those large crowds in front of Hamid Karzai Airport with flashbangs after a suicide bomber killed 13 American service members and at least 170 Afghans yesterday. An estimated 500 Americans still waiting to leave the country. And the newly released images of the Americans who made the ultimate sacrifice in Kabul. President Biden today vowing to complete the mission. And the stories from the people on the ground, an American family visiting a sick family member in Afghanistan caught in the chaos. How have you been, been able to keep you and your, your two small children safe? We're hidden in our house. We're not going outside. What happened to this family trapped there? And the major hurricane barreling towards New Orleans, mandatory evacuations issued tonight. Ida currently on pace to land in the U.S. as a Category 4 hurricane as early as Sunday. The dire warning tonight from officials. Our Rob Marciano with the latest track and our Victor Okendo reports in from New Orleans tonight. And the skyrocketing COVID deaths across the United States. More than 1,200 deaths reported over the last 24 hours. The highest single day total since March. And breaking late today, the intelligence community's investigation on the origins of COVID-19, what's inside their unclassified report, and what does it say about the role China may have played? We put that question to a member of the House Intelligence Committee. And this weekend, demonstrators are expected in the nation's capital. Why they're going and what they're fighting for. We send young people abroad to fight for this democracy. Surely we can pass legislation to protect it here on our home front. Good evening, I'm Juju Chang, in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We want to begin tonight in Afghanistan and the fallout 24 hours after that horrific suicide bombing. Tonight, we're beginning to learn the names, see the faces, and understand the heroism of the 13 fallen service members. Navy medic Max Soviak from Ohio. He graduated from high school in 2017. His mother telling ABC News he was very proud to serve his country. Marine Riley McCollum, from just outside Jackson, Wyoming. Marine Kareem Nikoe, his father saying he loved what he was doing. He always wanted to be a Marine. And Marine David Espinoza from Laredo, Texas, a 2019 high school graduate. And Marine Hunter Lopez from California. Those who knew him saying being a Marine to Hunter wasn't a job, it was a calling. Some of those who died would have been too young to remember 9-11 and the start of the war in Afghanistan. President Biden today acknowledging their bravery and their sacrifice by calling this a worthy mission, saying we will complete it. It's a mission that's getting increasingly perilous, however. National security officials saying these final four days before the deadline will be the most dangerous yet and that another attack is likely. Tonight, we know roughly 500 Americans are left behind, but can the government get all of them out, as well as more Afghan allies? Our Ian panel leads us off tonight. Tonight, continuing chaos and danger at Kabul airport. Flashbang grenades fired to disperse increasingly desperate crowds as the urgency grows to evacuate Americans and Afghan allies from the country. Planes departing throughout the day as hundreds of people again swarm the airport, hoping to get out in the next four days. The Taliban using military vehicles to block some of the roads leading to airfield gates. The morning's begun for those killed in the deadly attack at Abbey Gate. 13 American service members and 170 Afghans lost their lives, 200 wounded. President Biden warned today by his national security team that another terror attack in Kabul is likely, calling the threat specific and active, and saying the next few days will be the most dangerous period to date. They are uh, taking maximum force protection measures at the Kabul airport and in the surrounding areas with our forces. But today, the president insisting that evacuation flights will continue. Our hearts go out to all those who we've lost. But look, um, 
the mission there being performed is dangerous, and it's uh, now it's come with a significant loss of American personnel. And, uh, but it's a worthy mission. The Pentagon now revealing new details about what happened in the deadly suicide blast. The attack launched at 5.48 p.m. local time, immediately followed by gunfire from an unknown location. The military now clarifying only one explosion took place, not two, as initially reported. The Pentagon adding they're not sure how many service members died from the blast and how many from the gunfire, but revealing there were 11 Marines, one Navy medic and one Army soldier among the fallen. And tonight, we're starting to learn the identities of the Americans killed, including Navy medic Max Soviak of Ohio and Marines Riley McCallum of Wyoming, Kareem Nicoe and Hunter Lopez of California and David Lee Espinosa of Texas. 18 Americans also wounded in the attack, some medevac to Germany in special surgical units inside C-17 planes. But questions remain on just how this attack took place, with the Pentagon scrutinizing Taliban checkpoints. If they were able to get up uh, to the Marines at the, at the screening, at the, at the entry point of the base, there's a failure somewhere. It was a failure by, well, uh, you know, the Taliban operate with varying degrees of competence. Some of those guys are very scrupulously good, some of them are not. A photo from this week reveals just how dense the checkpoints can be. Dozens of service members within arm's length of those trying to get in. This is close-up work. The breath of the person you are searching is upon you. The president vowing to punish ISIS in Afghanistan, the group behind the attack. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. ISIS-K is made up of disaffected Taliban and foreign fighters, but they're the sworn enemy of the Taliban. Even so, hundreds of them escaped from prison as the Taliban released their own fighters during the rapid takeover of the country. In Washington, criticism mounting on the Biden administration for its handling of the evacuation, amid reports that American identities were shared with the Taliban in an effort to expedite their evacuation from the country. Leading Republicans now demanding answers, but the State Department denying it's been done in a way that exposes anyone to additional risk. But as the backlash intensifies, the airlift goes on. Officials reporting just over 4,000 evacuated from the country in the past 12 hours, the lowest figure in a week. The State Department saying they're working another 500 Americans who still want to leave. We will be able to fly out evacuees right up until the last moment. That's going to be the goal. And Ian Panel joins us now from Doha, Qatar. Ian, you are reporting, along with others, that the White House is saying another terror attack in Kabul is likely and that that threat is specific and active. And, of course, we want to be careful not to give away any operational details. But what are U.S. forces able to do to protect themselves from yet another attack? Yeah, I mean, that is the key question, right? How do you carry on the evacuation mission? How do you protect yourselves? General McKenzie has been very clear that he thinks, as does the White House, that another attack is entirely possible. The threat level remains extremely high. What they've done, again, without giving any way specific details, this comes from General McKenzie, is to increase force protection measures. So that's like anti-rocket, anti-mortar systems, other measures that they don't want to disclose, uh, but also communicating with the Taliban, how they're carrying out the checkpoints and hoping that the militants themselves carry out search. Uh, we've been reporting a number of roads around the airport have been closed off by the Taliban. Well, it, it's entirely possible that part of that is their attempt to try and increase security. Remember, the Taliban and ISIS are also sworn enemies. But also, General McKenzie saying that he believes some attacks have been thwarted. Juju? Ian Panel, thank you for that, and please stay safe. And we've been reporting on the unofficial networks of U.S. military veterans here at home who've been working around the clock to get their Afghan allies safely out of the country. Tonight, we have a heartbreaking story of one former Marine who guided his former interpreter and the interpreter's young family to the airport just before the blast. ABC's Martha Raditz has that story. It was a desperate attempt to escape among the thousands thronging towards Abbey Gate on Thursday, an Afghan interpreter, Obaid, and his young family, texting with the former Marine now in Florida, helping to guide the family to safety. I was just 
very direct with him and explained to him that I didn't know if we would have another window to get him out. So he continued to press. Andrew Darlington, who knew Obaid from his own deployments to Afghanistan, kept encouraging Obaid to move forward. Darlington's friend, an active duty Marine, would pull the family through the gate. Dude, he said to Obaid, you have this window. Clarify what you see. Can you see Marines? We are close, said Obaid, sending a picture of his location. They FaceTime. Darlington sees the Marines guarding the gate. Yo, stay there, please. Those are Marines. Obaid stops so he can follow these directions. Hold up a sign for the Marine guard that says professionals, the secret code for passage. And then the blast. Hours later, Darlington would learn Obaid and his wife were killed. Their two sons, just yards away with his brother-in-law, survived. Four-year-old has been asking where his mom and dad are. Um, neither one of them understand. Yeah, it was hard. Um, I really wish things were different. The Marine guard who was trying to pull them through the gate was wounded and evacuated, but is expected to live. Darlington is one of hundreds, if not thousands, of veterans, civilians, and others trying to help Afghan allies, saying the government has failed them. And thousands have indeed been rescued through a network of friends willing to do anything to save others. We have to get all of our allies out of Afghanistan. They literally have five days to live. And Martha Raditz joins me now. Martha, a devastating story there. But these networks are clearly expecting to continue their work after that full withdrawal, no? Uh, they are, Juju. These unofficial networks of, of some former CIA, some veterans, some civilians all across the country are helping these people in any way they can. They say they will continue to do that even after the U.S. military is out. But they are really pleading with the administration to muster any anything they can to help them, Juju. Such a fraught dynamic. Thank you, Martha Raditz. For more on the situation in Afghanistan and what comes next, we're joined now by Democratic Representative Jim Himes, a senior member of the House Intelligence Committee. Congressman, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Juju. As we all know, we're just four days away from that August 31st deadline, and we've reported on the president's national security team warning of another terror attack in Kabul being likely. What's your number one concern tonight, and are you confident that evacuations can go on safely? Well, my number one concern, Juju, is um, are getting the people, uh, the American citizens, the allies, uh, those Afghans who we have put in harm's way because they helped our military, getting them out. I have never particularly liked the concept of a deadline. Now, I understand why the president has a deadline. Uh, obviously, this is an enormously, enormously de uh, uh, deadly and dangerous place. Uh, and the longer we're there, the more dangerous it gets. The Taliban do not have total control, as we saw sadly two days ago, uh, of, of Kabul. Uh, and so I think the key here, uh, Juju, is to, for our military to stay long enough to get those people who can get to the Kabul airport out, and then, as distasteful as it is, to negotiate with the Taliban an arrangement whereby we get to oversee and protect a process, a process that could involve land borders as well as airports, to get the rest of the people out. And so you're not you're holding out hope for those Afghan nationals who helped. Take a step back for us for a second, though, in, in looking at the anatomy of what went wrong with this withdrawal. You're on the House Intelligence Committee. What questions do you want answered by the administration about this chaotic and tragic last few weeks? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and of course, you know, I've been pretty focused. My office has handled over 500 different cases of uh, of uh, individuals, Americans and non-Americans, who are desperate and trying to get out. So uh, that has been the mission. Uh, I haven't done a lot of uh, retrospection. Uh, I will tell you, though, there will come a moment where we have to have that conversation. I focus, Juju, and look. You can go back 20 years. You can go back 15 years. I focus on January, and the reason I focus on January is because you have a new president. 
Uh, and the new president inherits a situation where there are fewer people in fewer U.S. military security people in Kabul than there are on Capitol Hill protecting the Congress of the United States after the January 6th uh, insurrection. Uh, with the thousand or two thousand people that you had uh, in in Afghanistan at the time, you were not you had no options. And you know I know it's fashionable and sadly in this very partisan environment, people are pointing the fingers at Biden at Donald Trump. The reality is that January is a key moment because the last president left us with an untenable situation, and the new president Joe Biden and his people let that go on too long. Let's turn uh, towards what some people are calling a d digital. Dunkirk. ABC News has confirmed that there was this daring mission to save Afghan allies, especially Afghan commandos. And it was carried out by an all-volunteer group of American veterans of the Afghan war. They called it the Pineapple Express. They got as many as 500 special operators, Afghan special operators, out of the country at a lot of great personable risk. Why did it have to be so ad hoc and so um, sort of dangerous? Well, I think, big picture, this is another area for us to really scrutinize what went down. You know, I have I had suspected for a long period of time that the effort of getting out those CIV Afghans, the special immigrant visa Afghan, had gone on. By the way, it had come to a stop in, in, in 2020, but it was moving way too slowly. So what happens? Uh, you have a situation where the process is moving way too slowly, and a lot of those people, Afghans, who worked closely with our special operations people may not have had an opportunity to get to the embassy or to get to an American in Afghanistan, but they still have the cell phone numbers or the email addresses or whatever of the guys that they worked for. So those guys that they worked with, the special operations guys, the folks that are involved in the digital Dunkirk, um, a week ago, they were in some cases the only people who were in a position to make contact with um, Afghans who might not have been able uh, to get through to or into uh, the embassy or the airport. So I think they played a really critical bridging role. Um, you've raised the question as to whether the intelligence community was ignored by the White House or whether they just didn't sound the alarm loudly enough to the White House. I, I know you can't get into classified information, but given what you know, should the American people still have faith in the intelligence community to properly assess this very dynamic situation going forward? Um, yes, they should. And remember, my job is to be critical of the intelligence community. My job is to conduct oversight on the intelligence community, and it's a very privileged position because it all happens behind closed doors. There aren't journalists in the room. Uh, but yes, I saw all of the intelligence over time, and then I reviewed it last week. And again, I can't, you know, obviously I can't get into the details, but I can tell you this, that if you had seen or if anybody had seen the intelligence that I would see, that I have seen, nobody would say that the intelligence community got this wrong from a standpoint of reporting. But you you sort of got at one of my concerns. Um, there's a difference between writing a report saying, boy, things could really go south, and walking into the Oval Office and throwing a report on the desk and saying, Mr. President, you need to spend an hour on this right now. You know, that will be something that we will want to unpack. But I can tell you, and again, I can't get into the details, but I can tell you that this was not an intelligence failure. Our intelligence community, uh, over which I'm charged to be skeptical, was really sounding the alarm about how quickly and how badly Afghanistan could play out. You mentioned the distasteful option of working closely with the Taliban moving forward. Um, the Taliban reportedly uh, were given a list of names with Americans and our Afghan allies to evacuate. Does this go too far? I mean, one defense official told Politico, basically, they just put all those Afghans on a kill list. Your thoughts? Well, I certainly want to know what the facts were there. Uh, based on what I know, uh, Juju, and, and, and based on what is happening on the ground in Afghanistan, um, uh, giving the Taliban a list of Americans who need to get through their checkpoints in order to get to the Marines at the airport, that, that given what we know now, makes sense. Uh, we have not seen the Taliban attack Americans. That was part of the deal that was made under uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and so that part makes sense. But what what does not necessarily make sense to me is that you put Afghan names on that list, too. Now, I want to reserve judgment until I understand, you know, whose names were on the list and what the logic was and what agreements the Taliban made and whether they stuck by those agreements. But sitting where I am, uh, you know, in the United States right now, uh, giving the Taliban the names of Afghans who we want out because they helped us strike me as a very, very risky thing to do. 
clearly uh, a room for inquiry there. And before we let you go, I do have to get your reaction to the declassified report on the origins of COVID by the National Intelligence Agency. Officials found low confidence it was an animal infection that started COVID and a moderate confidence that it was a lab incident. I assume you've read this report. If, if that's the case, should China be held more responsible for this? And, and how do we move forward? Well, let me, let me tell you what I think, and then I'll tell you what I know. What I think um, is that uh, the report was pretty unsatisfying because the intelligence community, even though the president asked them to, was really not able to come up with a definitive answer uh, as to whether or not this was natural transmission from animal to human or whether there was a lab leak. Now, this is something that I've been reading about for a very long time in classified environments, and you know the intelligence community is a little bit at odds with itself on that. Now, why is that? And here's where you absolutely do hold the Chinese accountable. The reason for that is that the Chinese from moment one, 18 months ago, have not been open and honest uh, with the world or with the United States with the data and the information that we would need to form uh, some kind of a judgment. Well, I appreciate all of your insights. Connecticut Democratic Congressman Jim Hines, thanks for your time tonight. Thank, thank you. And next tonight, to a major threat brewing in the Gulf of Mexico, Hurricane Ida could make landfall in Louisiana as a major hurricane as soon as Sunday. So let's bring in our senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano. Rob, time this out for us. Well, Juju, it's rapidly approaching the coastline. This thing has really only been on a radar for a few days, and it's already a hurricane lashing into western Cuba. Let's take a look at it. Uh, it's getting a little bit banged up with the land interaction there, but once it gets into the Gulf of Mexico, it's uh, all systems go. This thing is likely going to rapidly intensify. That's the warning out of the National Hurricane Center. That's what our, our computer models are saying. So many of them are not only saying it's going to rapidly intensify, but take this track, which brings it to the coastline of southeast Louisiana Sunday afternoon as a Category 4 four storm with 140 mile per hour winds. Of course, hurricane warnings have been posted from just west of Lafayette to the uh, Mississippi, Louisiana uh, border. Uh, and this is going to have when you talk about cat four, you're talking about big time winds that will be damaging winds. We saw that with Hurricane Laura in southwest Louisiana last year. And we're also dealing with a big time surge 10 to 15 feet in that area. And if you're outside the levee system I and mean, they're telling people to evacuate right now inside the levee system, you'll be tested with that uh, sort of surge and also going to be tested with the amount of rainfall coming in with this 10 to 20 inches of rainfall near New Orleans and uh, that sort of rainfall is, is what the what the city can uh, handle this is going to come in uh, potentially on the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina Juju uh, this is a much different track than Katrina actually it's a much worse track for New Orleans theoretically uh, so we're just got to see what happens I know they're they're rushing to prepare for this as it quickly comes uh, to the coast and that's ironic everybody has Katrina front of mind as this storm barrels down but what has you most concerned as you eye this particular storm track well, you know, for one thing, you know, we've we've all rightfully been distracted with the other headlines in the news. So this hasn't been on the on the radar of the public really for as long as a lot of hurricanes are. And it's quickly moving to the coast and it's going to rapidly intensify. It's one of these things that's been a cat three, cat four for days. So I'm not sure everybody is aware. I'm not sure everybody's ready to get out. And I hope that that they will be able to get out uh, if they're told to do that tomorrow. So that's that's concern number one. Concern number two is when you're talking about a cat four, I saw it in Lake Charles last year. Uh, some of these some of the infrastructure and buildings in this part of Louisiana cannot withstand 140, 150 mile per hour winds. And it looks like that's where, what, what's going to happen. So we're talking about widespread damage as if a large tornado uh, would be coming through. I want to show you this one graphic, which gives you an idea of, of how goosed the water temperatures are two to three to four degrees above average in this part of the Gulf of Mexico. And that is just fuel for, for, for the fire. Uh, obviously, climate change in this case is amplifying uh, this storm. And that's a, a bit of a frightening scenario for southeast Louisiana, Juju. Well, Rob, so vital of you to be out there telling people to batten down the hatches. Thanks to you, Rob. You got it. And in New Orleans tonight, there is a mandatory evacuation order in effect for residents who live outside the levee protection system. The governor there urging all residents in the state, it's time to prepare now. Our Victor Akendo reports. Tonight, with an expected major hurricane taking aim, Louisiana hospitals already dealing with a surge of COVID-19 patients are now preparing to shelter in place 
Dr. Jeffrey Elder telling me this is a worst case scenario. This is a large hurricane. We have to be ready for that. We know we're going to have higher census because of the COVID patients in the hospital. And so we're preparing for both simultaneously. Louisiana has one of the highest COVID-19 case rates per capita in the country. The storm already forcing some testing and vaccine sites to shut down early. As residents race to prepare and evacuations begin, Ida is forecast to make landfall 16 years to the day since Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Okay, good. We met Dr. Tanner Libsack, still in his scrubs from treating COVID patients, now preparing to board up his home. And Victor Akenda joins us now. Victor, Hurricane Katrina devastated the city, as we all know, 16 years ago. And hospitals in, had a lot of major difficulties at the time. How are they preparing now differently, perhaps? Juju, one of the doctors that we spoke with explained how hospitals here have been hardened since Hurricane Katrina to bear the brunt of a storm. They fixed issues like water, sewage, electricity. And he explained how in the event where they have to be cut off from the rest of the world for some time, they're ready. Juju? Victor, all eyes on New Orleans. Thank you. And when we come back, over 1,200 people died from COVID in the last 24 hours alone, the highest single day total since March. We'll tell you where things stand in the pandemic right now. And left behind in Afghanistan, one man struggled to bring his wife and children home to the U.S. and get them safely through the chaos in Kabul. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is what being live is Bring all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. Squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The man who assassinated Robert F. Kennedy was granted parole in Los Angeles after two of RFK's sons spoke in favor of his release and prosecutors did not argue he should stay behind bars further. Sirhan Sirhan, now 77 years old, was facing his 16th parole hearing today after serving more than 50 years in prison for killing Senator Kennedy back in 1968. The parole board now has 90 days to review the ruling before handing it over to the governor for consideration.
So many Afghan American families are intently waiting for word from loved ones still trying to make it out of Afghanistan. We caught up with one family separated by thousands of miles. The father, an American citizen in San Diego, separated from his wife and two young children visiting family in Kabul. Alex Pache has their story. U.S. evacuations from Kabul were started overnight, a matter of hours after the deadliest day for American troops in Afghanistan in more than a decade. U.S. and allied forces on high alert for another possible terrorist plot. Thursday, ISIS-K, an offshoot of ISIS, claimed responsibility for an attack that killed at least 13 U.S. service members. The military still promising it will work right up until the August 31st deadline to get Americans out. We have the ability to include evacuees on U.S. military air airlift out of Afghanistan until the very end. Right now, an estimated 500 Americans are still there. The heightened tensions following yesterday's terror attack only making evacuations for them more dangerous and nerve-wracking for loved ones back home awaiting word of their safety. Hawad is an American citizen. So is his wife. They have a three-year-old boy and a 17-month-old girl together in San Diego. Last month, Hawad's wife took the children to Afghanistan to visit a sick family member. But with the Taliban takeover, they quickly became trapped. I'm worried. I'm worried about my family who are stranded in Kabul, Afghanistan for the past two weeks. We have been trying everything possible to get them out, but there is no way. Like, uh, we have tried everything to do so, but we cannot. Unfortunately, his wife has been in hiding while he's working on her behalf, collaborating with an attorney to get proper documents to the State Department to get her and the kids evacuated. They are in danger. The whole family is in danger. And my wife, everyone is citizen and they're concerned about their own safety, too. I'm afraid for their life. You know, I may lose them or, you know, they may die. Spotty communication with his family in Afghanistan only made him more anxious. But Hawad and our team were able to speak with his wife Thursday after that terrorist attack. How is the scene, uh, scene like? Uh, are you hiding? Yeah, so it's been very scary. We were deciding to uh, uh, head to the airport today. And we're thankful that we didn't go because there, uh, they were the embassy and uh, American embassy uh, were, were saying that of attack or something. That's why we decided to stay. How have you been been able to keep you and your, your two small children safe? We're hidden in our house. We're not going outside. I kept my kids at home. Uh, not just me and my kids. My whole family are at home. We're not. We're basically hidden. We can't go uh, to get the essential stuff. Uh, we're all scared. August 31st, a looming deadline. And as of Thursday, she had not received an evacuation plan from the embassy. I asked her if she thought that she and her children would escape. We were hoping to get out, but now I don't think we would be able to do that. Hawad, what gives you hope? At this moment, nothing. I'm like hopeless. In that moment, Hawad and his wife were beginning to accept the possibility that she and their young children could be stuck in the chaos in Kabul, a fear we've heard from dozens. Thankfully, Juju, the story doesn't end there. Since we first spoke to Hawad and his wife, they were contacted by the embassy in Afghanistan. His wife was given an extraction plan. She and her children were escorted to the Kabul airport. And as of tonight, they are awaiting a flight to safety and ultimately back to San Diego. But when you're talking about a deadline just four days away, a matter of hours makes all the difference. Juju? Our thanks to Alex for that remarkable story. Let's bring in American David Marshall Fox. We talked with him last week when he was struggling to get out of Afghanistan. I see you now there, just outside Boston. You told us last week that you'd been hit by a rubber fan belt by the Taliban as you tried to get into the airport. Tonight, we are happy to report that you are back home, safe with your family outside Boston. Thanks so much for joining us, David. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, welcome back to the States. What's it like to be back on American soil? Um, it's really, it's, you know, it, you know, it's, it's obviously, a, you know, a big relief to be here. Um, you know, it was an extremely stressful, um, uh, you know, one week where we were in Kabul 
um, when the Taliban were in control. Um, I personally was, you know, uncertain about how much risk we actually face from the Taliban, but there was a lot of pressure from, from my family members, from my friends, um, and from uh, officials that I knew in the U.S. government who said that, you know, potentially, you know, things could get much worse and the, the situation was really too unpredictable for me to be there safely with my family. After all the chaos and the violence that you endured at the airport, what was it like going back and having to get through onto that evacuation flight? It must have been terrifying. So my experience being successfully evacuated was much different from my first attempt to get into the Kabul airport. I was contacted by an Afghan-American friend who had received an email telling him to be at the Ministry of Interior uh, southeast gate between 10 p.m. and midnight to be evacuated. I had not received this email, but um, I was fairly certain that I was qualified with my family members to also be evacuated. We rushed to do our packing and we headed off to the Ministry of Interior. And when we got to the Ministry of Interior, we realized that this was not like our other experience trying to get into the airport. In this case, the Taliban were in control of this Ministry of Interior gate. And what they were doing was vetting um, the, the individuals who had been contacted by the U.S. government to be there. So basically, this was a situation where the U.S. government had finally realized that they could not complete the evacuation of U.S. citizens without the Taliban's assistance. So these two entities, the U.S. government and the Taliban, had coordinated um, with uh, U.S. passport holders and green card holders and immigrant visa holders to be at this gate where the Taliban was actually conducting the screening of documents to see who was eligible. You were gone only 24 hours before uh, two suicide bombers took the lives of 13 servicemen and scores of Afghan nationals. What was your reaction seeing uh, the suicide bombing there at a gate close to where you had been just 24 hour, 48 hours before? I had been to those gates with my family members, you know, a couple days before I was evacuated. So I knew how dangerous it was. Those gates were too dangerous um, <clears throat> for the exact reason, um, for the exact reason that we saw in the last 24 hours, where people were, were vulnerable to you know suicide attacks, and also where the Taliban themselves were extremely you know reckless with their firearms. I don't think the Taliban had the intention to actually you know kill um, you know people who were trying to enter the airport. But they certainly were extremely, you know, brutal with their methods of crowd control. David, you lived in Afghanistan for nine years. Your wife is Afghan. You clearly know both Americans and Afghan nationals who may not be able to get out at this point or, or even before the deadline. What are you hearing from people tonight? Give us a sense of the desperation in the final hours before the deadline. Even um, some of my employees who, you know, I, I, my company was just a small agency that, that produced photo and video content and did some market research. But my employees were terrified that just working with an American would mean that they were, you know, marked for, for, for death by a Taliban kill squad. You know, th this is what they believe. Now, we don't know what's going to happen, but we do know that the people, that, the Afghans that were left behind are in mortal terror right now. David Marshall, thank you so much for your time and for joining us tonight, and welcome home. Sure, thank you so much. And still ahead here on Prime, 58 years after the march on Washington, thousands are expected to join marches across the country this weekend to demand more action on voting rights. The head of the NAACP will tell us why he thinks this fight is more important than ever. Plus, there could be another opening on the highest court in the land, the high-profile possible retirement we're all keeping a close eye on. And the major legal settlement that could change how much we pay for the apps we really love. But first, our tweet of the day, one of soccer's biggest stars coming home. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day.
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Now to a major legal settlement between Apple and a coalition of app developers that could change how much we pay for the apps we love. Here's a look by the numbers. Up to 30%. That's the commission Apple gets when we buy apps through the App Store. But now Apple has agreed to let iPhone app developers email their users about cheaper ways to pay for digital subscriptions. App developers will also get more flexibility to charge different prices within their apps, expanding to about 500 choices. And Apple will continue to lower its in-app commission to 15% for smaller app developers. They began doing this last year, but now say they'll extend the discount for at least another three years. And finally, Apple will set up a $100 million fund to pay thousands of app developers covered in the lawsuit that's dragged on for two years. The plaintiffs accuse Apple of having a monopoly over app distribution. Apple, for its part, touts its reach, saying that it, quote, provides more than 30 million registered developers with all the tools, resources, and support they need to create and deliver software to over a billion customers. Well, that's certainly a staggering number. And we still have a ton more to get to here on Prime, why thousands of people could be out on the street thanks to a late night ruling by the Supreme Court. And the story behind what's already one of the most iconic photos from the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCNews.com. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by no people squeezing into this bomb place. shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. 
Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. The race to evacuate American citizens and allies in Afghanistan is now even more urgent and dangerous. President Biden's national security team warning another terror attack in Kabul is likely. Look, um, the mission there being performed is dangerous and it is uh, now it's come with a significant loss of American personnel. In the deadliest day for U.S. troops in Afghanistan in more than a decade, the Pentagon says more than 5,400 people are still inside the airport awaiting flights. As children return to school, the debate over masks continues. In Florida, school districts wishing to require masks were handed a victory in court when a Tallahassee judge ruled in favor of parents who sued to overturn the governor's executive order banning mask mandates. Face mask policies that follow CDC guidance are at this point in time reasonable. And intelligence officials have just released a report on the origins of the COVID-19 virus and their findings are basically inconclusive. According to the report, four intelligence agencies say with low confidence that the virus initially was transmitted from animal to humans. At least one agency believes with moderate confidence that the first infection was linked to a lab. However, other experts say that there's simply not enough evidence to come up with a decision. Analysts do agree that it was not developed as a bioweapon and that Chinese leaders did not know about the virus prior to the start of the pandemic. Meanwhile, in Washington, a divided Supreme Court struck down the CDC's nationwide moratorium on evictions. It was meant to keep people in their homes during the pandemic. Millions of renters could now face evictions. The Supreme Court's position was straightforward. If there's going to be a moratorium on evictions, it can't be imposed by the CDC. It's got to come from Congress. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer reveals he's struggling to decide whether to remain on the bench after next year. In an interview with the New York Times, 83-year-old Justice Breyer says, I don't think I'm going to stay there till I die. Hope not. The liberal justice admits he doesn't want someone reversing everything he's done over the last 25 years. Breyer is the oldest current Supreme Court justice. Dancing with the Stars revealed its first two celebrity contestants, including one dancer who will be part of the first same-sex pairing in the show's histories. YouTube star Jojo Siwa identifies as pansexual. The 18-year-old former dance mom star says she looks forward to breaking barriers and representing her LGBTQ community and people who just feel a little different. They actually asked me, do you want to be with a boy or with a girl? And immediately, there was not even a question I knew to make it right for the people who come after me that dancing with a girl was the exact thing that I wanted to do. Amid the tragedy and chaos coming out of Afghanistan, a tender moment caught on camera, a U.S. Marine holding an Afghan baby. The viral photo of Sergeant Matthew Jaffe hitting close to home here at ABC News. Jaffe's mother is one of our WABC New York stage managers. By the way, people caring for that baby asked Matthew to keep holding him because his smile was causing the baby to smile and have a lasting moment of joy during this crisis. Meryl says smiling is her son superpower and just seeing that that moment that you know he even though I'm sure there is chaos around him he saw that baby needed uh, someone to make him laugh and to feel I guess secure Merrill wants all military families to know they are not alone and there is support for families with loved ones serving our country in dangerous locations. The infant in the photo with Matthew has since been reunited with its father. The power of a smile.
now to the pandemic and the rising death toll in this country from COVID. Sadly, we just hit the highest number of deaths in one single day since early March. All 50 states are now seeing what's called high community spread. Back in June, no states fell into that category. But one bright spot for us, vaccinations are also up. Here's ABC's Whit Johnson. Tonight, the toll of the pandemic growing by the day. More than 1,200 deaths reported in just 24 hours, the highest single day total since early March. It's tough for the ones who have been through it already to see to see these people struggle and die. In just the last month, the virus spreading like wildfire. All 50 states now reporting high community transmission. In Oregon, hospitalizations up nearly tenfold in the last six weeks. But with fewer staff and fewer beds, we're struggling to meet patients' needs. Hospitalizations in Kentucky breaking records. The governor frustrated. I'm going to admit up front today, um, a little emotional and a little raw. But in Florida tonight, a major legal victory for 10 school districts to find Governor Ron DeSantis's ban on mask mandates. A judge ruling the governor overstepped his authority, DeSantis vowing to appeal. This as the country reaches a new milestone. 50% of kids 12 to 17 years old have now had their first vaccine dose. And overall, more than a million doses administered in the last day, the most in eight weeks. In central Florida, Lisa Stedman now wants the shot. She and her husband were holding off when they both got COVID. Lisa coming home from the hospital this week, only to find her husband had passed away from COVID-related complications. And remember, you are not promised tomorrow, so you better make sure you tell your loved ones you love them. And Witt joins us now with the Director of National Intelligence today releasing that unclassified assessment on the origins of COVID-19. Tell us about it. Juju, this report indicates that the intelligence community is divided over the findings. Four agencies assessing with low confidence that the COVID-19 virus spread to humans naturally from an infected animal. Another agency assessing with moderate confidence that it came from a lab leak or lab incident of some kind. However, there is more agreement that the virus was not created as a biological weapon. Still, more information is needed from China. And tonight, President Biden is promising that efforts to understand and the origins of this pandemic will not rest. Juju. Wait, Johnson, thank you. It's been 58 years since Martin Luther King led the historic March on Washington. And this weekend, thousands are expected to attend marches across the country, including in our nation's capital, to demand more action to expand voting rights. And for more on this, I'm joined by NAACP President Derek Johnson, whose organization you may know recently launched a national campaign to combat voter suppression. Thanks so much for joining us, Derek. Thank you. Uh, we know you wrote an op-ed in USA Today earlier this week emphasizing that voting rights should not be a partisan issue, and yet the reality is it very much is. The House recently passed the John Lewis Voting Rights Act this week along party lines, but it faces an uphill climb in the Senate. Are the, are the numbers just not there to get these bills to President Biden's desk? Well, we don't need 50 members of the Senate to support protection of our voting rights. But we should not allow a procedural rule that was used by segregationists to impede our democracy. And that's what we're up against now. With NAACP, we're saying that there are 50 senators in the United States Senate to pass this legislation. It's not about partisanship. It is about our democracy. And yet, given that Democrats are struggling to find a path forward on enough votes in the Senate on legislation, what's the end goal for the protests this weekend? What's the message? Well, it is continue the heightened uh, urgency to make sure that this is a priority. If members of the Senate can come together and pass a three-plus trillion dollar package, surely they can pass legislation to protect the right to vote. This is not about one community. This is about our democracy. We're looking at the collapse of what took, that took place in Afghanistan. We send young people abroad to fight for this democracy. Surely we can pass legislation to protect it here on our home front. You're well aware, Derek, that uh, while President Biden has previously called the pair of voting rights bills in Congress a national imperative, he hasn't seemed to make it a big administration 
priority um, with issues like infrastructure, as you mentioned, and Afghanistan dominating the White House's time right now. Do you believe that the president has done enough on this issue, or is there a, a lack of political will or, or urgency from this administration? Well, for us, we're looking at this one uh, body at a time. The houses have done their job. Now it's for the Senate to do their job. And once the Senate do their job, we're looking for the president to sign this legislation. So we're really focused on the outcome, not the words, not the, 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 the statements of support, but an outcome to ensure all Americans can go to the polls, cast an effective ballot, and that we do away with political gerrymandering, which is so important to ensure that our voices can be heard across this country and have a true representative democracy. And so speaking of words, have you had any recent conversations with President Biden or, or his team on efforts on voting rights? And, and if so, what's the message? Well, yeah, my message has been consistent. We are in ongoing communication with both the leader of the Senate, uh, the administration, and our message is very clear. Pass this legislation. There are no other options. The sense of urgency needs to be there, and we're going to keep, keep pushing. We will have people on the ground and while they're on recess. We will have people in D.C. when they come back in September because there is nothing more vital in this moment to, than ensuring that all Americans can exercise their right to vote. One of the um, details that stands out in your op-ed is the number of bills that have been introduced by state legislatures uh, making voting rights in this country more difficult. So far, you pointed to at least 17 Republican-led state legislatures passing voting restrictions in recent months. Given the pace at which Republicans are moving on these bills, are Democrats running out of time to address this before the 2022 midterms? Well, it's unfortunate that elected officials are trying to select their voters. In a democracy, voters select those who represent them, not the other way around. And we are pressing the sense of urgency of members of Congress to do their job. This is not a partisan issue. This is an issue to ensure that we have elections that are fair, that are transparent, that are inclusive, so all legitimate citizens can fully participate in the electoral process. And that's all we're asking for. This is not a Republican issue or Democratic issue. This is an issue about America. It's a moral obligation to protect our Constitution. And I want to get your reaction to another question brewing in the nation's capital today in the headlines. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling to suspend the CDC's nationwide eviction moratorium. Congressman Cory Bush, who led a protest that successfully led to the administration, taking action to extend that moratorium, said in a statement today that the black and brown communities, and especially black women, will bear the brunt of this decision. Your reaction? You know, Congresswoman Cory Bush is speaking from a personal experience. It is unfortunate in the midst of a current homelessness crisis that we are uh, witnessing in this country, something that's built, been building up for several years, is going to be compounded by individuals being evicted. We must have a permanent solution to, to the, the ability of individuals to be in housing. That's important. When you go to Los Angeles and you see the level of homelessness, you go to Seattle, Washington, or you name the metropolitan area, you see the cross-section of loss of opportunity, the lack of job opportunity, the, the need for mental health support, and young children who are living or in cars and in tents. It is a national disgrace. We must address the issue of homelessness. We must address the housing crisis as it has confronted this nation for, for several years now. Derek Johnson, president of the NAACP, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And we'll have much more after the break, including a bovine evacuation that will have you saying, holy cow. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The most powerful stories of our time Anytime. Nightline.
Monday, get excited. I'm excited. Because Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez are gonna kill it on GMA. Why would you say that? <laughs> Monday, it's gonna be deadly funny. That to me is hilarious. On ABC's Good Morning America. So were you the nanny or were you the girlfriend? I moved in to help with the kids. When we had opportunity, I still slept with him. He chose the nanny. Yeah, the nanny. Martin McNeil murdered his wife. He finally has what he wants. His wife is dead and his mistress has moved in. He's having tea at this very moment with his new best friend, Satan. Now, a life of lies uncovered. The perfect nanny. The 2020 event special tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. What I love most about Richard Pryor? Rebel. The funniest person on the planet. Raw. Brutally honest. Game. Uncensored. Oh my God. <laughs> Everything. The N word. The N word. Wait a minute. <laughs> I beg your pardon? He set the stage. The comedy of Chris Rock or Dave Chappelle or Eddie Murphy. Then, like a comet, it flamed out. Now, emotional interviews and details. Just look at me with your heart. That's all I ask. Superstar Richard Pryor. Wednesday night at 10 9 Central on ABC. And finally tonight, the image of the day. Let's just say it was moving day. See what I did there in uh, Switzerland? Where a dozen injured cows were airlifted by helicopter to the bottom of the Swiss Alpine Meadow. According to Reuters, the cows were harnessed and brought to the mountain pass in central Switzerland ahead a local bovine parade. The rest of the 1,000-strong cow herd is making their walk slowly on their own. That's her just hanging out there. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks always for streaming with us.